I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery, but I don't protect the paintings. I want the job, I said. It was two years ago, but I can vividly recall that interview. The innocence of those four words. My befuddled reaction to Amy Andrews, the gallery owner whose questions unsettled me. Her composure never waned. Are you a spiritual man, Mr. Hull? Miss Andrews asked. Yes, I answered. Are we talking about the art? I can't say I'll be able to give philosophical or religious insights. Don't worry, Miss Andrews replied, smiling. I'm not trying to trip you up. In a way, my question does relate to the paintings, but perhaps not in the way you might expect. You know, I was a police officer for many years before working as a security guard at the embassy, I said. I have plenty of references. The gallery owner raised a hand, smiling politely. I've seen your CV, Mr. Hull. I promise that you don't have to fight your corner. I know you're physically capable, but this job takes a toll on a mental level. I nodded my head, believing that I had understood her. I know, I worked many solo night shifts at the embassy, but I can handle it. That's not what I mean, she replied. Do you know why my gallery exhibits a permanent display of my sister's artwork? I shifted uncomfortably on my feet. I uh, saw that news clip a couple of years ago about her admittance to the local psychiatric ward. Harper Andrews, right? I'm sorry. That must have been tough on your family. Her artwork tells the story of her decline into sickness, Miss Andrews said. Not sickness of the mind, but sickness of the soul. She faced something and captured it in these paintings to protect humanity. Hearing her speak, Amy seemed just as unwell as her sister. I would soon learn that it was no delusion. Every night on the job is terrifying, but none so much as the first. And I'll never forget Miss Andrew's parting words as she walked out of the door. At night, the paintings must be closely guarded. Left unobserved for too long, they can... I'll just make sure you keep watch. What is this night at the museum? I thought, trying not to chuckle. The first hour of my shift was blissfully mundane. Basking in the blue glow of the gallery's security lighting, a perturbing painting eyeballed me from the far wall. It depicted a lanky, pencil-thin man with frightfully long legs, and a pair of white eyes which seemed to follow me around the room, as all freakish eyes in paintings do. As I strolled around the gallery, following Miss Andrew's strict rule of regularly observing the paintings, I took a closer look at the white-eyed man, I shivered at his janky jaw, which hung abnormally loosely. He wore jet black trousers, but his monstrous bony torso was shirtless, and he was the farthest a man could be from looking human. I stopped to read the plaque beneath the painting of the haunting figure. The Exactor. The one who exacts torture. He longs to break free. He will devour mankind. I hurried past the painting, reasonably certain that nobody would ever dream of stealing artwork so horrifying. No need to guard it too closely. But the paintings didn't exactly become more joyous as I continued my round. I should have given them more than a cursory glance before applying for the job position. They were petrifying. Another portrait portrayed a young girl, no more than ten years of age, who wore a bright red pinafore, plaited brunette hair, and a blank face. Not figuratively. Blank. In place of eyes, a nose, or even a mouth, there was only skin. Taut flesh, painted with smooth brush strokes that made Harper's intentions abundantly clear. The artist had not mistakenly smudged the face. 
She had purposefully neglected to give the little girl any features. The plaque read, Harper's youth dies. As we age, we slowly come to life. We sin. They know that. They know everything. And there were numerous paintings of dreadful scenes. Cities in ruin. Endless infernos of melting flesh. And the dead seemed to be the lucky ones who were offered a swift mercy. The survivors in the apocalyptic paintings were tortured in gory, gruesome ways by horrid, inhuman men like the one in the first painting. I usually have a strong stomach, but something about those paintings filled me with sickening dread. The apocalyptic art seemed so visceral. Whilst I viewed the paintings, I was convinced I could actually hear the screams of the last humans on Earth. I felt the heat of the flames on my skin. I saw the exactors move. And then there was a painting of the art gallery itself. The plaque read, Prison. They entered our world, so I locked them here. Feeling suitably terrified, I scurried to the sofa by the gallery's entrance, retreating from the horrors I'd witnessed. The exhaustion of that jam-packed day finally hit me. It was only when I sat down that a wall of fatigue walloped me. I don't even remember my eyelids closing. But I remember them opening. An hour later, a thrumming sound startled me awake. I twisted my head to see it was only my phone vibrating, and I chuckled in relief. I opened the message from Kara, my wife, welcoming the distraction from my isolated, soundless night shift. It was an odd message. I was telling my mum about your new job, and she said you should look for another one. Apparently there are always adverts for the position online, and her friend's husband had a nervous breakdown after working only one shift. He won't talk to anyone about what happened. There was another thrumming sound, but it wasn't my phone. It was a muffled voice. My head snapped up in time to catch a silhouette vanishing behind one of the gallery walls. I managed to stifle a scream, but I lost my composure and clammed up. I contemplated running out of the gallery, but something stopped me. And it wasn't the prospect of being fired. It was those paintings of Armageddon. It was Amy Andrews' warning. I rose to my feet, using the flashlight on my phone to illuminate the dim gallery. That muffled sound repeated, haunting me, a ghostly groan of some emotion I couldn't quite place. And when I rounded the first corner, I found myself facing something utterly inexplicable. The girl from Harper's youth dies. A young version of Harper, minus any facial features. I trembled on the spot as she took clunky steps towards me, with frail, fragile legs. She continued to groan, seemingly speaking beneath the flesh that covered her entire face. I quaked in horror as the ghastly girl stopped in front of me. Then, driven by a frightful force beyond my control, I found myself leaning forwards. My cheek started to twist to the side allowing my ear to plunge through the phantom pool of the girl's face. I screamed silently, terrified to find that I was unable to move my body or utter a sound. And with my ear beneath the flesh on Harper's horrendous, featureless face, I could finally hear the words the malformed ghost had been repeating in a distorted cry. Why did you close your eyes? My body was suddenly hurled to the floor, and the little girl fled into the shadows. My eyes shot to the far wall of the gallery, and I found that my gut achieved the impossible. It sank to a deeper realm of fear. He was gone. The exactor was a blank canvas. A horrible entity had escaped its painting. Harper's disembodied voice whispered beside my ear, stopping my heart for a second. 
Find him. I looked up at the ghostly girl's painting. Harper had returned to the canvas. Her canvas. But she was adopting a different pose. Her index finger was pointing at the painting of the art gallery. Prison. I saw what she had noticed. Behind one of the painted windows on the empty top floor of the building, that inhuman man stood and watched me. And then his petrifying painted form flitted out of sight. Legs shaking, I walked across the gallery to the set of stairs in the back corner of the room. They led to an out-of-bounds floor. Miss Andrews made that abundantly clear. But she also made it clear that I had to keep my eyes on the artwork. And I failed at that. So, I didn't really have any options. I had to go upstairs and clean up my mess. Quivering. I crept up the creaky wooden steps to a floor that was littered with unhung paintings. The frames were shrouded in white sheets, and at the far end of the room, illuminated only by the moonlight which poured through the murky glass panes, I saw something truly terrifying. The Exactor. He stood as tall as the ceiling, and his large form was crouching over an uncovered painting. As I crept closer, I saw what had captivated the terrible creature. It was one of Harper's apocalyptic landscapes, depicting a world in flames. The exactor was melding its shriveled, unclothed arm with the canvas, much as young Harper sank my ear through her flesh. However, as I approached the abomination, casting my flashlight upon him, its flesh started to sizzle and it unleashed a hideous hissing sound. At first I thought the light to be hurting it, but then I realised it had become aware of the guard's watchful eyes upon it. I finally realised the power of keeping watch. I knew why I was there. Cast it away! Harper's voice whispered. How? I cried. The man spun around and I screamed at the sight of his wretched white eyes. They were worse in the flesh, and he was far larger than he had appeared in the painting. The entity lunged at me, coiling its bony hands around my neck and squeezing the light out of my soul. I slipped into the darkness, and the exactor unleashed a howl that sounded like a boat's horn. I wheezed, watching flickering images in the exactor's blank eyes, Prophecies of a direful destruction, a fiery vision of mankind's end at the hands of this terrifying apparition and its demonic army. It intended to scare me, but the thought of such a horrific future only motivated me to keep my eyes open. I won't stop, I said choking. In human flesh burning beneath the weight of my vision, the exact screeched in fury. I thought all hope had been lost. I thought the world might already be doomed. If I'd passed out, I would have left the demon unguarded and free to torture the world. But in some favourable twist of fate, it released my neck and I fell to the ground. It too must have been close to death, unable to bear my gaze a moment longer. The exactor disintegrated before my eyes, fleeing the room in an airborne pool of black paint. I crawled downstairs, and the canvases were filled with paint once more. Everything was back in its place. What you might find strange is that I didn't hang up my hat. I didn't call it a day. When Miss Andrews came to the gallery at six in the morning, she seemed fully prepared to watch another traumatised guard quit the job. But I couldn't. Not after seeing the exact as apocalyptic desire. Too much is at stake. My night shifts as an art gallery's security guard are more horrifying than anything a person should endure. My job isn't to protect the paintings. It's to protect humanity from the paintings. Each canvas is a paranormal cell. The artist, Harper Andrews, 
contained a terrifying interpretation of her younger self in a portrait as a safeguard. That faceless child isn't even the worst thing in there. There are paintings of mankind's doom, hellfire, Armageddon. And then there's the painting of the exactor. An inhuman man, tall as a tree, with woefully white eyes and a limp jaw. He and his malformed minions are imprisoned in the gallery's exhibits, and they seek freedom. They long to eternally torture mankind in unimaginable ways. They plot a fate worse than death. One particular evening, about four months ago, a text conversation with my wife took an unsettling turn. Cara, you can quit the day job, surely. You're making plenty of money from the gallery. Me. You just want to spend more time with me. Kara. Well, it is a little suspicious that you spend so much time away from home. Have you got another woman on the side? Amy's hot in a squint-your-eyes kind of way. Me. There's a higher chance of me hooking up with one of Harper's demons. Kara. Ooh, that reminds me. I just bought one of her paintings. Couldn't resist. I should have told my wife about my work. I should have told her about the terrible nature of the things I guard. After reading her message, I hurriedly rang her. Please tell me you were joking, I said, shaking. Are you okay, Frank? You sound... weird, Kara replied. Why did you have to buy one of the paintings? I asked. What? You know I like macabre things, she chortled. Don't be a baby. You stare at those paintings all night. What's so wrong with having one of them in our living room? I don't understand why Amy would sell her sister's work, I said. Well, I pulled her aside for a chat after you showed me around the gallery. Honestly, I can't believe it took you over a year to give me a tour. Such beautiful paintings. Disturbing, but beautiful. Harper Andrews is incredibly talented. What happened to her is sad, Cora sighed. You just made an offer that Amy accepted, I asked. She claimed to have little attachment to it. She said it isn't one of the paintings that demands eyes upon it. it seemed a rude comment because I think it's as great as the rest of her sister's art, but I have to go, I interrupted, hanging up the phone. It was an hour or so before my night shift, but I arrived early. Amy Andrews was engrossed in conversation with the last few gallery visitors of the day, but I quickly dragged her away from the crowd. Fury frothed to the surface of my lips. Why did you sell one of the paintings to Cara? I asked. Miss Andrews answered in an eerily flat tone. I come from a wealthy family, Mr. Hull, but I'm not that wealthy. I have limited income streams and I have to keep the gallery's lights on. Sure, I make money from memberships and fundraising events, but I do try to sell paintings too. You know they need to be watched at all times, I protested. Not all of them, she said. And that was when I realised which painting was missing from the gallery. There was an empty spot on the wall above the plaque that read Harper's Youth Dies. What have you done? I gasped. My sister's demented self-portrait might be horrifying, Mr. Hull, but it doesn't intend to harm us. It's not one that needs to be watched. And your wife paid handsomely for it, Miss Andrews explained, shrugging. I gripped my employer's arm in a moment of madness that could have cost my job, and, for all I knew, the future of mankind. On my very first night shift... Harper was the entity that kept watch over me, I hissed furiously. Your sister painted herself for a reason. Everything in this gallery has a purpose, don't you understand that? For a flicker of a moment, I was certain that something flashed in Amy Andrews' eyes. Something black. And the corner of her lips twitched, as if to reveal that she were well aware of what she had done but her mouth quickly returned to its normal position. 
I pay you to watch over the exhibits, she said. You shouldn't need anyone or anything to watch over you. I clenched my fists. I'm going home, and I'm bringing that painting back with me. Miss Andrews huffed, glancing at her watch. Fifty-five minutes until your shift begins. I'd hurry. I drove home, mind racing from the horror of Miss Andrews' crooked grin. Did she intentionally sell the painting to sabotage the gallery? I wondered. Don't be foolish. If she were that evil, she could just leave the paintings unwatched, freeing the exactor into the world. Why would she even have hired me? I tried to still my throbbing heartbeat as I pulled onto our street. After hurriedly parking, I raced into our darkened home and started screaming at the top of my lungs. Kara, Where are you? In the living room, she shouted. Why are we yelling? I rushed into the lounge, and my chest loosened a little. There was no sign of destruction, just my wife sitting on the sofa in a well-lit room. Harper's youth dyes hung on the wall, but the girl's ghastly form remained in its canvas. I exhaled. What is your deal with this creepy little girl? Kara asked, laughing. I just... I I have to take it back, Kara. I'll make sure Miss Andrews gives you a refund. My wife rose to her feet and walked over to the painting stroking Harper's featureless face. I shuddered in terror, waiting for the ghoul to leap free from its frame. I assumed that she wouldn't hurt us, but I wasn't certain of anything. Come and give her a stroke, my wife teased. She doesn't bite. I looked at my phone. I had half an hour until the start of my shift. Miss Andrews hadn't made it clear what would happen if I weren't on time. Given the diabolical glint in my employer's eyes, I feared she might do something worse than fire me. She might leave the paintings unattended. I'll buy us a better piece of art for the wall, I said. Something creepy from another gallery. Just anything other than a Harper Andrews piece. Please. Would it make you happier if I were to draw a smiley face on it? Kara asked. My wife a primary school teacher, scooped up a sheet of smiley face stickers, and I gasped as she used them to form a crude pair of dots and a pencil-thin smile on Harper's featureless face. Kara frowned at my gawping mouth. Relax, we own it. Besides, I can easily take them off, don't worry. I walked over to her and seized her hands tightly, taking a deep breath. Kara, I said gently. I'm begging you. She frowned. I know that look, Frank. You're you're genuinely scared, aren't you? What's actually happening here? Just tell me and I'll let you take the painting back. I sighed. You saw a ghost when you were young, didn't you? Kara nodded slowly. My dad. Shortly after the car crash. Hard to believe. Well... I know you believe. You said you once saw your grandma's ghost, didn't you? I nodded. So, we believe in spirituality, don't we? This painting, all of Harper's paintings, are gateways to... to something unearthly. And that's why I guard them. I'm sorry for lying to you. My wife looked at me with fearful yet understanding eyes. You talk in your sleep, you know. You've been having nightmares for months. Talking about a tall man and the end of the world. I knew there was something you weren't telling me. The light suddenly cut out. And a wisp of wind, like a shrill voice, filled the room. Kara shrieked and leapt into my arms. I shuddered, keeping her close to my chest so she couldn't see what I saw. The stickers on Harper's featureless face glowed faintly in the darkness. The most terrifying part was that her smile had inexplicably transformed into a sulk. Kara? 
I'm going to take it back now. My wife nodded, face burrowed deeply into my chest, so I guided her to the bedroom and instructed her to shut the door. I checked my phone and I was horrified to see I only had 20 minutes until the start of my shift. I seized the painting from the wall, gingerly plucking off the stickers. Sprinted out of the house and lunged into my car. When I arrived at the art gallery, the lights were off and Amy's car was nowhere in sight. Fortunately, I was on time for my shift but I had no way of knowing how long she left the place unattended. I hurried inside and immediately hung Harper's youth dies above its plaque. The gallery was complete. Everything was in its right place. I looked at the painting of the exactor, and I was relieved to see the monstrosity was still encaged. But something still felt wrong. There was a churning chasm in my gut. You're not in the art gallery. Harper's entity whispered in a clunky, garbled voice. The colours of my surroundings started to swirl. The gallery walls, the floor, the paintings, and even my hands appeared murky. The world was composed of paint. I was composed of paint. And when I looked at the street outside the gallery windows... I was terrified to see the towering edges of a painting's frame. I was trapped in prison. Harper's depiction of the art gallery. I could see the real world beyond the canvas. My memories flooded back. When I'd entered the real art gallery, the exacter tricked me. He stood in his painting, and everything seemed fine. I looked into those horrible white eyes and that's when its mouth tore open to swallow me. I screeched into the hellish nothingness. Never had I felt such nightmarish horror before, not even on my first night in the gallery. It was worse than death. I thought I'd entered hell itself. I thought I'd failed at my job and the rapture had commenced. I thought of so many terrible possibilities as the exactors blackened void engulfed me. Squirming inside his lightless body, I was carried by the inhuman man across the gallery floor, and he aggressively spat me into the canvas of prison. He made me forget that I'd left the real world. It's looking for an exit. Harper's voice croaked. Me too, I cried. I looked at Harper's youth dies, but she wasn't there. In her place, there was a doorway with a flickering green exit sign above it. I felt the brush strokes of that painted world stretch and strain. The canvas was crushing me. I didn't belong there. My painted form tightened, and I rushed to the doorway that Harper had created, terrified of what might happen if I were to stay in that false world for a moment longer. As my hand met the painted canvas within the painted canvas... My body liquefied and merged with the exit. A blackness, still and serene, enveloped me. And then I found myself lying on a tiled floor. A real tiled floor. Choking. Back in the real world, or so I hoped, I gazed across the gallery, and my eyes met a terrible sight. The content of every painting had spilled onto the floor, the exactor stood proudly amidst his inhuman followers, plotting in a sharp whisper. I'd expected a cacophonous roar of noise from the apocalyptic demons, but something about the near silence of their scheming was even more frightening. In the distance, I could hear human screams again, the apocalyptic sound of mankind being tortured endlessly. Their agonising cries were almost tuneful, in a terribly dissonant way. Choral screaming. Humanity's horrifying outro. Suddenly, in unearthly unison, the many exactors snapped their heads backwards to face me, as if the brittle bones in their necks had jellied. I screamed at their upside-down faces, which hung over their emaciated backs. 
They were white-eyed and slack-jawed, eyeing me from the middle of the room. They wheezed as their skin sizzled beneath the weight of my eyes upon them. Back to your paintings, I feebly yelled. There was nothing commanding about my tone. Pure terror drove me, and the exactor could see that. His eyes pierced mine. In them, I saw nothing. The absence of anything. And by that, I mean the end of everything. The end of man. The end of ends. He tried to fill me with dread beyond imagination. And he succeeded. But it was the same fateful error that he made on that first night. I thought of Kara. My parents. My friends. Everyone I loved. That was what motivated me to persevere. Whilst my eyes watered under the strain of looking at those unearthly men. Their ghoulish voices chittered that I must either close my eyes or die. I didn't fall for their egregious scheme. I clenched my fists, armed only with my eyes and sheer willpower. The minions retreated first. Flesh burning, they scurried backwards, dragging their upside-down heads and misshapen limbs with them. Back into the flames of their painted paradises, but the exactor remained, mouth gaping so wide that it hung past his shoulders. Smoke billowed from his searing torso and raggedy trousers. In one final fit of rage, he took powerful strides towards me and outstretched one of his slender arms. I caught his wrist before those gnarled, ghastly fingers could wrap around my neck, but the pain was unexplainable. It was a deep burning of the mind, not the body. The exactor's last-ditch attempt to incapacitate the guard who was standing between it and the apocalypse. I saw Kara. She was sitting in our living room, smiling at something on the wall. I could only watch in unbridled horror as her flesh melted before my very eyes. Terrifyingly, she continued to smile even when she'd been reduced to smouldering bloody meat on the sofa. The exactor showed me what she saw. On the wall, there hung a painting of our house burning to the ground, in the midst of mankind's total annihilation. On the streets, the exactors inflicted unspeakable acts upon humanity. A demon gutted a woman with the protruding bone from her own severed limb, but I knew it wasn't real. I knew the exactor was playing mind games. I stood my ground. My eyes ached under the immense strain of watching that unholy apparition. But the exactor caved first. Unable to endure my gaze upon it, it wriggled its wrist free from my grip, taking what appeared to be excruciating steps back to its canvas. And when it returned to its frame, Choral screaming ceased. All sound ceased. The gallery was still and silent. I spent the rest of my shift standing in that exact spot, eyeballing the paintings before me. I didn't speak and I didn't move. Before I left the building, at the end of my shift, I quickly glanced back at prison, the painting that trapped me. Existential dread gripped my heart, and four months later, it still hasn't released me. I can't stop thinking about how it felt to be within that canvas. I might be living in a painting right now. Since my first shift, nothing has been the same. Every passing day feels worse than the last. The impending apocalypse casts a long shadow over my life and I worry about something other than the exactor. Amy Andrews. Something's wrong with her. Perhaps I should speak to the one person who could actually give me some answers. Yesterday afternoon, I visited Harper Andrews at the local psychiatric ward. I know why you're here, she said. 
The woman was slim, and she wore pristine white attire. Her brunette hair was glistening in the midday sun. It hung in prim and proper plaits, which made me shudder. She was the spitting image of her painting, Harper's Youth Dies. That was unnerving, given that she was a couple of decades older than the painted version of herself. Harper smiled, motioning at the seat opposite her in the deserted canteen. I nodded awkwardly and slumped into the stiff plastic chair on the other side of the table. A member of staff loitered in the canteen doorway, keeping a watchful eye over us. Two years on the job, right? Harper asked me. You already know your role. You would have summoned the courage to visit me a long time ago if this were only about the exactor. I shivered at the very mention of the name. I'm not blaming you, Harper continued. I just don't beat around the bush. My sister isn't evil. In fact, she's a kind-hearted woman. Part of her is still in there, but it's not the part that's in control. Amy longs to free the exactor and the others. I paused for a long time, staring into the dejected eyes of the woman before me. She looked sharp, focused, well. Not at all what I had expected. If Amy poses such a threat to everyone, then we should... I trailed off. Harper sighed, reading my mind. Yes, I suppose killing her would have brought an end to things, wouldn't it? Yet, somewhere deep down, she's still my sister. I'm sorry. And why, you might wonder... Hasn't she already freed the creatures from their painted prisons? That final question is the one that really needs to be answered, I said. Harper nodded. Do you have your phone with you? Yeah, I replied. Why? Record my story, she said. I need you to document the knowledge that I'm about to pass on to you. Nobody has ever believed me, but you've seen what's at stake. This is the transcript of what I recorded. The year was 2003. I was eight years old, and Amy was in her twenties. My birth certainly caused an upheaval. Mum was a full-time lawyer, and Dad was a historian. They thought their days of parenting were long behind them. Mum, did I ruin Dad's life? I once asked. You were the best curveball that life threw at us, darling. My mum promised, and we chuckled. Dad loved us, but he spent so much time abroad. I didn't see him often. He wasn't quite so busy or successful in his youth. He worried that he had been a better father to Amy. One fateful day, he sought to rectify that. Back to Pichu, he said. Let's go, you and me. What's in Pikachu? I asked. My father laughed. Machu Picchu. It's a lost city. I think you'll love it. You could paint it. Your talents are wasted on the dull scenery around here. I didn't think I'd enjoy ancient ruins, but I couldn't pass up the opportunity to spend time with Dad. Plus, he seemed so excited about the place. It was stunning. And after hours of watching my father excavate what he called... A point of interest. The man finally started to dance jubilantly. I stopped painting to see what had enthralled him. The fruit of his labour was a large slab of stone, and it was covered with dreadful etchings of ghastly creatures. My dad started jabbering ecstatically about the magnitude of what he'd uncovered. He spent a decade connecting dots between the mysterious vanishings of advanced cultures. There were indicators of a destructive force, a plague greater than anything earthly. He said there were entities which sought to destroy humanity, though their origin remained a mystery. They certainly weren't bound by physical laws. And my father uncovered detailed writings on rituals which successfully contained the abominations. He said salvation always came from imprisoning the entities, but they couldn't be killed, and they would always seek freedom. That was what terrified me. 
they would always seek freedom. And my father held their prison in his very hands. He had unearthed something which should have been left alone. I can't explain it, but I always knew that it was more than a story. I felt something when I looked upon that slab of stone. Not darkness, emptiness. When we returned to England, I slipped into my father's study and found his translated texts. I had a terrible feeling about the stone slab that he'd brought home. So I studied the ritual that could imprison the entities. It involved detailed drawings and a watcher. But who was watching the drawings whilst they were buried beneath the earth? Nobody, it would transpire. My father's research seemed to suggest that the Inca artist in Machu Picchu had uncovered a new ritual, something which allowed the Incas to trap the demons more successfully than their predecessors. If my father had only let it be, he would still be living a normal life, Frank Hall. The demons would have been imprisoned forever. None of us would be in this catastrophic situation. Things quickly took a dark turn. My parents started bickering about that stone slab. Dad would obsessively stare at it until the early hours of the morning. He said it spoke to him. When my mother couldn't take it anymore, she left. Amy and I were straw, and we hated our father. That was when my sister did something stupid. One awful evening, she destroyed the stone slab with a sledgehammer. The exact and his deformed creatures steadily rose from the shattered stone, and I fled the lounge. It was the moment I had dreaded, the prophecy which had riddled me with nightmares. I locked myself in my bedroom and unboxed the paintings that I completed weeks earlier, when I had anticipated something foul. To imprison the free demons in my new pictures, however, a ritual was required. Like countless artists before me, I dislodged one of my teeth. I'll spare you the gory details. But bloody gummed and teary from the agony, I started to shakily etch my name into each of the paintings with my baby tooth. And the most horrifying thing happened. One by one, Black masses started to slither under my door. The creatures were unwillingly latching onto their painted forms. They were encaged in the new prisons that I had created. Weaker prisons, but they held. As long as these pieces of art were watched and guarded. And then the house fell unnaturally still. So I crept out of my bedroom and called for my family. When I entered the living room, I shuddered. The demons were gone, but my dad was sitting in his rocking chair. His eyes were vacant and he was smiling. It was a wicked grin. Blood oozed through finger tears in the fabric of his shirt. He had been clawing at his own flesh. He was still alive, but he didn't move a muscle or utter a word. He just grinned. Amy, meanwhile, was curled on the sofa in a fetal position. She was bawling her eyes out. And when the police arrived, they discovered something disturbing. Mum never left. Her body was discovered in the garden shared by responding officers. She'd been decomposing for weeks. I never saw the scene, but I vividly remember one of the paramedics vomiting on the grass. Our father went to prison, and Amy became my guardian. I explained everything to her, but she didn't believe me. Even after what she witnessed, she didn't believe in the demons. So I kept a daily watch over the paintings, and years later, I used my mother's inheritance money to open the art gallery. I thought it would lessen the burden if all their eyes were on the paintings. Amy helped to run the place. She had her hands in various money pots, so she didn't mind that the gallery was, 
a bit of a money burner. However, one day, she changed. My sister came home from the gallery with a distant look in her eyes. A look that reminded me of Dad. She told me that she finally believed my story. She saw the exact to step out of its painting. I couldn't always be at the gallery, but Amy promised she would never leave the paintings unattended. She admitted that she had gone out to grab some food before locking up for the evening. If she hadn't returned in time, I... I suppose you and I wouldn't be having this conversation right now. The world would already have ended. My sister transformed into something else over the following years. She grew cold and distant. I started to see a darkness in her eyes, and she spoke in a voice that wasn't hers. I became so fearful of her and her malevolent smile that I had a nervous breakdown. And that was her ticket. Well, the exactor's ticket. She had me committed to this ward four years ago. I suppose the exactor knew that, without me in the way, he could puppeteer Amy to free him from the painting. All she had to do was make sure nobody looked at him. But Amy would have released the exactor already, you're thinking. After all, it employs slaves to free itself. It utilises psychological warfare seeping into people's minds. At its behest... I'm certain my father must have destroyed whatever ink and tools used to etch the drawings on the stone slab. If it had so wished, that terrifying creature would have driven my sister to kill me, much as it drove my father to kill my mother. So why haven't things already fallen apart? Well, I have something that the exactor needs. The tooth. Even if Amy were to close her eyes and stop hiring security guards, it wouldn't be enough to free the entities. They're tied to their painted prisons, and those cells cannot be destroyed until the tooth is destroyed. I'm aware that it sounds like watching these paranormal prisons might be unnecessary then. After all, as long as I keep the tooth hidden, they can never fully free themselves. Sure, they can wander, and they can play tricks on minds, they can't exact their plan of mankind's destruction. So you can just quit your security job and call it a day, right? There's no way that the exact can fulfill its destiny. But the problem is that, unwatched, the exact becomes freer with every passing moment. Free to locate me without Amy's help, perhaps, and infiltrate my mind to find the tooth. That's why you're so important, Frank. As long as somebody keeps watch, these abominations remaining their paintings. That's why I call it a prison. And you're the prison guard. I finished. Right. Their real power lies in servants. My dad, and now Amy. She visits me often, but she only wants one thing from me. The tooth. And I still hold the power. My sister does what I say. She hires security guards, she makes sure the paintings are watched at all times. Otherwise, I've threatened to end things. Then the secret would die with me. And that's everything, Frank Hull. The rest is a mystery even to me. I stopped recording at that point, and I exhaled deeply. There was so much information to digest. I mean, you heard that transcript. Sorry to anyone who didn't prepare themselves for such a gargantuan listen. Amy's trying to sabotage things, I explained. She let Harper's youth dies out of the gallery. Harper sighed. It might be time, then. Time for me to... No, I didn't mean that. I firmly said. Harper's eyes were brimming with tears. I'm tired, Frank. I'm so tired. I'm just one person. But you're not alone, I said. I'll keep watch. The girl sniffled. 
and what happens when you reach your breaking point. This is bigger than us, Frank. I think we finally need to tell someone. I scoffed. Who? The government? You think that would be a good idea? Give the exact hundreds of minds to infiltrate? It's dangerous enough that your paintings are visible to the public. You and I won't live forever to fight the good fight, Harper pointed out. Then we keep looking for people to take up the mantle. Or maybe we eventually figure out what that Incan artist did to truly seal the lid on these monstrosities, I said. He found a way to put them in the bin for good. No watcher needed. Harper sighed. There's one more thing you should know. What? I asked. The tooth, she said. It's in our house. Whoa, stop, I barked. What are you doing? The secret dies with you, remember? Yes, but Amy's never going to stop looking for it. So you need to keep her away from the- Please, I begged. I don't know why you're telling me this. Something isn't right. I looked up to find the orderly had left. And that was when the clamp tightened on my gut. The sun seemed to dim and an emptiness filled the room. I know that sounds like a contradiction. An all-consuming emptiness. But I'm sure Harper felt it too. Her eyes widened. Frank, Harper croaked. Is there a red Range Rover in the car park? Legs trembling, I crept over to the canteen window and squinted. Grain cloud hovered heavily above, and blue sky lay beyond the solitary omen. There seemed to be no other hospital visitors. Beside my white Mitsubishi, there was only a crimson Range Rover in the car park. Frank, Harper began. You need to... A splintering sound echoed around the canteen, and I spun around to see something sickeningly sinister. Harper's neck had been snapped backwards. Her upside-down head hung over the back of her chair, much like those menacing exactors in the art gallery so many months before. In the doorway of the canteen, there stood a figure too tall for the frame. I screamed, squinting my eyes. But it was Amy. She seemed to be a regular height, but I know what I saw for a fleeting second. The exactor. I chased her out of the building, heart racing as I prepared to meet a similar fate as Harper. But the exactor spared me. Besides, Amy was nimble. I was no threat. She'd driven away before I could reach her, but it was already over. The dilapidated childhood home of the Andrews sisters harboured secrets. Though I was armed with Harper's knowledge, the brutish buildings still intimidated and mystified me. The terror stemmed from more than vines creeping up walls, or the graffitied innards of the long-abandoned abode. It was the place's unearthly aura, lingering evil from the horrors that had unfolded twenty years earlier. Why did Harper tell me where she'd hidden the tooth? Perhaps the exactor wormed its way into her mind, finally succeeding in tricking her. I blame myself. She was careful for so many years. She lowered her guard around me, lost herself for a second, and that was all the exactor needed. As soon as Harper exhausted her usefulness, she was slaughtered. I can still see her mangled neck, draped over the rigid back of that plastic canteen chair. The basement of their family home was a lightless hovel that carried a damp smell. I illuminated the cobweb-ridden room with my phone, and something elicited a blood-curdling scream from my hoarse throat. Amy. She was on her knees, shivering in the centre of the room. She didn't even shield her eyes from my light. She merely stared into my face with a blank expression, and I realised something horrifying. The exactor was gone. I couldn't see the darkness in her eyes anymore. 
and if the creature had no use for servants, that could only mean one dreadful thing. The end was nigh. A bottle of hydrochloric acid confirmed that. It lay beside a gaping hole in the floorboard's woodwork. Amy had destroyed Harper's tooth, the only thing giving our eyes the power to imprison those frightful entities in their painted cells. That meant the ritual had been broken. My... my family's dead. Amy sobbed. It was as if she'd been in a trance for years, and only at that moment, decades later, could she finally process the awfulness of what had befallen her loved ones. Don't worry, I coldly replied, struggling to empathise. Soon everyone will be dead. The woman bawled, and I kept seeing her younger sister's neck, the very neck that Amy had viciously snapped several hours earlier. It was hard to trust her. How long has it been? I asked, pointing at the acid-formed cavity in the floor. I destroyed... It destroyed the tooth shortly before you arrived. Within the hour, perhaps? Amy absentmindedly replied. I nodded before facetiously asking, how long do you think we have before the world ends? Miss Andrews sobbed. When I freed them as a child, they... they took their time slithering out of the slab. They began constructing legions of creatures from the very dust of our house. Harper must have been upstairs for a couple of hours. And the world didn't fall apart. I sighed. Let's just savour Earth's final hours before hell opens. Listen, I've been reading my father's books. Amy sniffed. The only ones are left in this ransacked house, anyway. If we hurry, we could... I think it's over, I said. Amy's eyes sharpened, and her brow furrowed, but it wasn't evil that I saw in her eyes. Not the exacter. No, it, it was resolve. The final dregs of a desperate human's resolve. That's it? What about Kara? She asked. Are you just going to let everything end? Well, what can we do? As we speak, the horrors are crawling out of their paintings. It won't be long before they wreak havoc upon mankind. And we're not exactly artists, so I doubt we could whip up. I trailed off, possessed by an inspired idea. The covered paintings on the gallery's top floor. Exact copies of the ones downstairs, I whispered. Amy slowly nodded, gathering my drift. My sister's backups. The name etching ritual. Does it have to be performed by the original artist? I asked. Amy shrugged. The texts only specify that the one who uses a sacrificial etching tool will bind the apocalyptic abhorrences to their drawn likenesses. So, if I were to etch my name into each of Harper's backup paintings, I thoughtfully whispered, delicately tapping one of my teeth, but then I sighed. We're miles away. It would all be over before we could reach the gallery. Amy's eyes wandered. You know, there are other ancient rituals that our father detailed in his translated texts. Mayans, Incas, and other ancient cultures learned things that modern people have forgotten. When their cities fell to ruins, the survivors utilized centuries of spiritual teachings to engage the Exactor and its legions in prisons. What ritual could save us? I asked. A painting of the gallery, she answered. We could use it as a doorway to the real one. My blood froze. I immediately recalled my terrifying experience in prison, being trapped in a painting that I truly believed to be reality. Harper's ghoulish child form freed me from that hellish place with an exit doorway. 
but I swore to myself that I would stay firmly grounded in the real world for the rest of my life. Never again would I blur the line between reality and fiction. And yet, Amy was suggesting I willingly step back into that existential hellishness. And how would I ever know that I've returned to the real world? I asked. I could be trapped in another painting. This wouldn't be like the other pieces of art. It'd be a doorway, not a prison. You can feel the difference between painted colour and real colour, she said. I know that, and you know that. The exactor did things to me too. Even when you were in prison, part of you always knew that something was wrong. I know it's nearly impossible, but you have to trust me. Or failing that, trust yourself. Amy was right. A painted lie could never convince a person forever. But how could I be sure? Even now as I type, I consider that I might have been tricked. I might still be trapped in a painting. Perhaps the world has ended outside of my prison canvas. But in that moment, I had to agree. After all, the alternative was the certain extinction of humanity. Time was of the essence. But we're back at square one, I pointed out. We need a painting of the art gallery to serve as the gateway to the real one. Do you know how to paint? Can you create a believable likeness of the art gallery on a canvas? I certainly can't. I think you underestimate just how many paintings my sister created in her youth, Amy said, smiling. She guided me out of the basement on shaky legs. We moved to England because Harper couldn't bear this place anymore. But we also moved because I had business contacts in your country. Anyway, I found the perfect little spot for my teenage sister's art gallery. Amy continued his story as we clambered up the creaky stairs. So what was the first thing Harper did when I showed her the property? She painted it. The new prison for her macabre paintings. She said it gives a building power to be included in the ritual. Of course, I didn't believe in her deluded ramblings back then. Harper left the painting of the art gallery at this house. She said she'd do a better one at some point. The one which became prison. Do you think her rough, early draft, so to speak, is a good enough likeness of the art gallery to work? I asked. I really hope so. I don't want you to become trapped in some non-existent painted realm. A half-human, half-splintered thing. Great pep talk, I said. Really makes me want to do this. Amy opened the door to Harper's bedroom and matter-of-factly replied, Not like you have a choice, is it? Unless you want me to do it. I didn't trust her enough for that. Inside Harper's old bedroom, a stack of half-finished paintings lay on her dusty, neglected duvet. Amy and I sifted through the pile, eventually finding Harper's early attempt at creating prison. Obviously, before moving to England and turning the property into an art gallery, Harper's visions of grandeur were a teenage fantasy. Fortunately, her painted vision was not too far removed from what the art gallery became. I wanted to do something for her, Amy somberly explained, cradling the painting. After Mum died and... Dad ended up in prison. Harper wasn't the same. I thought a place for her art would help her heal. As much as the paintings horrified me. How do we turn prison into a doorway to the real art gallery? I asked. Sacrifice, Amy quietly replied. Every ritual demands sacrifice. Hasn't that always been the way? Another tooth, I asked. To bend the construct of space, Mayans bent the mind. That's what my dad wrote in one of his unprinted books, Amy said, handing me a bottle of Jack Daniels. I laughed. You're messing with me, right? I need to drink to save the world. To travel elsewhere, you have to loosen the connection to your present position in time and space, Amy replied with a deadpan expression. I suppose harder drugs would work, but this is all I've got. A bottle of Jack. I planned on drinking myself to death before you arrived. 
I sloped most of the liquid down my throat, ignoring the burning sensation and the desire to vomit. Touch the canvas, Amy instructed, pointing at Harper's painting of the art gallery, and repeat the following words after me. Try to pronounce each syllable clearly. I placed my hands on the early version of prison. Amy Andrews began to speak in an ancient language, and I followed suit. After several minutes, the alcohol started to hit my system, and I had to concentrate incredibly hard. The colours of the painting started to swirl, and then something horrifying happened. My flesh melted. I shrieked, truly believing that Amy Andrews had deceived me. I watched my skin liquefy, meshing with the canvas, and my jaw dropped in terror. It's working, Amy cried. Good luck, Frank. What about you? I murmured, slipping into the canvas. Amy smiled tearily. Every ritual demands a sacrifice, Frank. The line between fiction and reality disintegrated. What remained of Harper's bedroom had transformed into a swirling whirl of painted colours. But I saw Amy Andrews clearly. I saw that blue painted tear trickle down her peachy textureless cheek. I saw the blade that her painted form produced from her pocket. The colours started to mix, but I knew what she was about to do. I tried to scream at the horrifying sight, but my face was composed of a dripping painted liquid. My limbs slowly warped out of shape, and I felt nothing. That absence of sensation was the true terror. My eyesight blurred as the vibrant kaleidoscope of colours seemed to bulge and spiral. The painted art gallery grew to fill the room, and my body became sloshy paint on a ceaseless canvas. Then I fell onto the darkened floor of the real art gallery. Nobody had been watching the paintings for hours. Not that it mattered. After the destruction of Harper's Tooth, eyes were powerless against the Exactor and its legions. The ritual had been broken. They were free. Resolving to fix that, I pulled myself to my feet. The world hadn't ended. There was time, but the gallery's eerie silence horrified me. Not as much as the first thing I noticed, of course. Empty paintings. Every piece of artwork, except Harper's youth dies, had been abandoned by the monstrosities that I was supposed to guard. The girl sat in her painting with her faceless head in her hands. She was sobbing and I felt like doing the same. Her painted form seemed even more terrifying in the wake of the real Harper's direful demise. She mumbled, slipping her head out of her hands and motioning for me to come closer. And as I did, she leant out of her canvas. I placed my ear against her face, shuddering as it slipped once more beneath her flesh. They're destroying the upstairs paintings, she whispered. But they won't find the apocalypse. Before I could ask what she meant, her canvas flopped out of its frame and softly floated to the tiled floor. I gasped at the hidden painting on the back of Harper's youth dies. It depicted everything. Every terrible entity. Every apocalyptic situation necessary to keep the demons lost in their false paradise. Clearly that hidden painting had always been Harper's real plan B. A more efficient way of trapping the creatures. Only one painting to watch. And only one name to etch. Heart throbbing against my chest, I plunged my hand into my mouth. Pinching a canine with my thumb and index finger, I took a deep breath. Closing my eyes, I tugged with all of my might. I couldn't seem to free the slippery canine. I needed a tool to loosen the ritualistic instrument. I ran over to the reception desk and rummaged around in the drawer for a pair of scissors. Then... I started to slam the blades into... Well, I'll spare you the details. I eventually dislodged the tooth. The blood gushed in a free-flowing waterfall. 
hand trembling, I victoriously held the canine up to my eye and began to laugh deliriously. I was still inebriated, of course, but boy did it hurt. Drunkenly stumbling towards the apocalypse, painting on the back of Harper's youth dies, I finally saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Hope for humanity. An end to that dreadful evening. And then the front door opened. Frank? Kara cried. Where did you go? I spun around, shakily reaching towards my wife. Kara? Go home. Her eyes grew, and she screamed at me. Look out! A heavy hand constricted my throat. Not a human hand. I already knew what had seized me. The weighty wave of hopelessness and existential dread was unmistakable. As rotting fingers hoisted me off the ground, the thing started to twist my body, and I found myself facing it. There, inches from my colourless face, was the exactor. Its wicked white eyes pierced mine, but that wasn't what filled me with horror. What terrified me was that its flesh wasn't sizzling under the weight of my gaze. No tooth, no imprisoning ritual, no power. And that ever gaping, ever slack mouth suddenly closed, as if the creature were no longer furious at me. In its place, the demon offered a smile, the most abhorrent smile conceivable. The one I'm sure Amy and Harper saw on their father's face. I wheezed, gasping for air as the skeletal creature, twice the height of any person, throttled my throat. I eyed the face of boundless power, a thing older than time itself. The edges of my vision started to blacken, but I had no tricks up my sleeve. My eyes could no longer imprison it. Losing consciousness, I prepared to fade into oblivion. A sudden scream saved my life. The exactor dropped my body to the floor, more concerned with the spectacle in the main reception area of the gallery. I turned to face my wife, and I screeched too. Harper's ghoul had seemingly fled its painting, the canvas which still lay on the floor and I could only watch in helpless horror as the faceless monstrosity, a small deformed girl, merged with my wife's body. The exactor unleashed its boat-horn cry, and its minions inexplicably seeped through the cracks in the tiles of the gallery floor, slinking their slender bodies into the room, morphing their forms into full-bodied limbs. And I suddenly saw why they were so animated. Kara's eyes rolled into the back of her head, and her body began to levitate. Horrified, I wondered why Harper's childlike form had turned on us in our darkest hour. But then something incredible happened. Kara hissed horribly, eyes still rolling into the back of her head. Now I see. The exactors began to lurch towards my hovering wife and I watched in bewilderment as she effortlessly flicked them aside. The exactor paced across the gallery floor towards her, crunching the meagre bodies of its henchmen beneath its feet. Kara and Harper couldn't kill the things, but they weren't trying to kill them. They were trying to buy time. Breathlessly spluttering from my swollen neck, I crawled across the floor, and when I reached the painting of the apocalypse, I opened the palm of my clenched hand to reveal my bloody canine. Writing tool at the ready, I finally started to etch two crucial words into the painting. Frank Hull. Those choral screams sounded again, the symphony of dying people. But it wasn't real, and that was a good thing. It meant the exact was trying to weasel its way into my head. It meant the ritual was working. I looked up to see a gaping mouth of fury on the ten-foot-tall ghoul's face, 
the exactor's minions began to decompose, turning into blackened masses of paint, much as Harper had described back in the psychiatric ward. The creatures slipped into the painting of the apocalypse, imprisoned once more. The exactor, of course, held on to our world for dear life, shrieking under the weight of my eyes upon it. Its flesh was a blazing inferno, and he released one final pained cry before slipping into the apocalypse. Only half conscious, I stumbled over to my wife, who was lying on the floor in a dazed state. I, I was coming here to tell you off, she croaked. I cried with laughter, relieved that my wife was okay. What happened to you? I asked. Kara coughed. I came to save you. No, I, I, I mean... Oh, right. It was still me in there. Harper just showed me the way. It's like I said. I had to save you. But the evening shocked didn't end with the re-imprisonment of the exactor and the other demons. In the early morning hours of my shift... Amy Andrews walked through the door. I gasped, eyeing the bandaged stump that used to be my boss's right arm. But that wasn't what shocked me, of course. She was alive. I'd misinterpreted the severity of the sacrifice she made, and I think that revelation saved my fractured mind. I couldn't handle any more death. Amy's family suffered enough. Amy suffered enough, locked out of her own mind for 20 years. I intend to keep Miss Andrews far away from the exactor, so he never sinks his claws into her again. We've talked about the future of the art gallery, but there's only one painting that really matters anymore. There's only one that's still fully intact. The Apocalypse. And, well... Harper's you've dies on the reverse side, but that's our little secret. Amy Andrews said I can keep the job, and she's hired somebody else to watch the place during the day. Somebody who understands the importance of the art gallery. Kara. We're not too happy about our new lives as prison guards, barely seeing each other. But we'll find others who can help us in the future. Besides, this is bigger than us. Too much is at stake. I'm a security guard who works the night shift at an art gallery. And I think I need a raise. <laughs>